Hi folks, welcome to Fig Tree Ministries. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking that red subscribe button below and click that bell to make sure you get notified every time we upload a new video. Enjoy today's lesson. All right, so once again, Sea of Galilee, part six. And as was alluded to in our opening prayer, the cultural aspect is so amazing to bring depth to God's Word that I can tell you that each week as we do this, I'm blown away by just how amazing and rich the Bible can be. And today we're going to look not so much, we're going to look at a couple different Bible verses, not a lot of Bible, but how the geography, the land of Israel, plays into the whole uh, message that's coming out of Scripture. And it may feel, I feel it's a little bit disjointed, I just want to say that on the front. We're going to talk about the Jordan River, but we're also going to talk about something with the Sea of Galilee, because that's really just a wide spot in the Jordan River. And then at the end, I'll show you how the sages of Israel take all this stuff, the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee, and put it together into something, a concrete message for all of us that we can engage the, with the world with. How do, how do I say that again? It's a concrete message that all of us can use to engage the world. So that's what we're going to end up at. So it's a few different things. And one of them, and I just want to be real clear, we're going to talk about a legend. It's a legend. So we have some Christian legends, meaning we don't have all the information in the text, and so we kind of fill in the blanks with things, like, you know, the innkeeper who turned away Jesus and Mary, even though that doesn't mention an innkeeper. So there's going to be some legends, and then Paul is going to address one of those legends. So I just want to be clear as we talk about this, and you think, now that's just crazy. Yes, it's a legend. So anyways, we'll do Sea of Galilee and a legend. We'll talk about the Jordan River and especially the spiritual symbolism. This, the Jordan River looms large in the minds of Christians, and there's so much spiritual sim symbolism to it. And then, of course, we'll finish with a rabbinic teaching that connects all of those. So there's a picture of the Sea of Galilee the same one we've seen all week. Now, here's a photo of the Jordan River. Now, what normally happens is that as people see the Jordan River, they're always a little bit disappointed, especially if you live near the Mississippi or something, that it's not that large, even though it looms large in the mind of all of us. We have it just has a much bigger presence than when you get there and see that, well, it's not really a raging river and it's not a few miles wide. Now, this picture you're looking at was taken in September. That's when the water is at the lowest point, kind of like here in San Diego, when the rivers are at the lowest point, would be in the dry season. So those rocks I'm standing on, if this was six months later in, in March to April, they would be, it'd be flooded over. It'd be, uh, the river would be running high. This picture, sorry, is north of the Sea of Galilee. So just to the north, say, around the town of Bethsaida, so the water looks a little bit clearer. It's a little bit faster running river. This picture is the traditional site of Jesus' baptism. This is down by the Dead Sea. Now you look at the water, and it starts to look more like a muddy river, and it's muddy down there. They actually don't recommend that you get in that water because the, the amount of runoff that's coming down by the time it hits that part, there's probably bugs in there you don't want to get. So most people want to do their baptism closer to the, to the Sea of Galilee where the water's cleaner. Anyways, this one was taken in January, so the river's higher. So that's down by the Dead Sea. And I'll show you a couple maps to help give you a picture of that. Okay, so let's... Um, I'll start by just doing a, a brief, an overview geographically, to, so that you can mentally see where we're going to be talking about today, the location of it. So you have the Mediterranean Sea right here, so that's to the west of Israel, 
You have Jerusalem sits in the mountains just to the west of the Dead Sea. So Jerusalem is up in those on the, on the mountainous ridgeline, sits at about 2,300 feet. And then we have two seas, two seas in Israel. You have the Sea of Galilee, and you have the Dead Sea. Now, neither of them are seas as we think about them, but those are the two seas. And what they share in common is the Jordan River. Up here in the north, in the very northern part of Israel, is a mountain called Mount Hermon. And I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. But Mount Hermon is the mountain that the snow melts and seeps down through the the rocks. It comes out in springs. I'll show you pictures in a minute. And it begins the Jordan River. So the Jordan River starts at the base of Mount Hermon to the north. It then runs pretty much straight south, down what's called the Rift Valley, through the Sea of Galilee, and into the Dead Sea, where it ends. The Dead Sea is the lowest place on earth. The water doesn't run out of there. Now, just that picture right there, it's only, it's 120 miles. And you think, well, that's not a huge river. It only goes from the north of Israel down to the Dead Sea. Again, it's kind of like this idea of the Jordan River lives bigger in our minds than it actually is. It's a fairly short river. It basically runs north to south in one direction and ends at the Dead Sea. So that's where we're going to be going, and I'll take you all around these areas as we talk this morning. So the first one, just to show you, Mount Hermon, northern part of Israel, where Israel meets Syria and Lebanon, is this mountain here. Now. You'll notice this picture was taken in January, so there's snow. And Mount Hermon is snow-covered about eight months out of the year. It's over 9,000 feet. And as that snow melts, there's a ski resort up there if you wanted to go skiing. As that snow melts, it goes through the rock, and it comes out into these springs that begins the Jordan River. So this is one of the things that actually brings the water down through the land of Israel. So that's kind of our overview, where we're going. Now I'm going to take a little bit of a detour here and talk a little bit about the Sea of Galilee, because I said the Sea of Galilee is really just a stopping off point for the river. It's a a wide spot in the river. So the Sea of Galilee, there's a legend that connects with the Sea of Galilee. and You can imagine this land is so dry, there's so little water, you can imagine, what if you lived, you grew up right next to the Sea of Galilee, what would you think? How much God is blessing you by providing this fresh water? I mean, it's really, it's an amazing thing, particularly in this dry land. So, you know, they're, they're, they're looking at how is it, how is it that God is still blessing us through this lake, right? We're desert people. We're not, they're not lake people. Us who come from Northern Europe, we're water people. We're used to the water. So there's going to be a legend that's going to go into the blessings of the Sea of Galilee, and then Paul is going to address that legend. So I just want to show you that about the Sea of Galilee. Now, one thing that's cool, this is a complete aside. This is bonus material. Notice in this picture, if you can see in the foreground of this picture, right here, it's a sheep pen. So I don't know if you can see that on your screen or not, but you can see the stones have been set up to make a, a circle. So a shepherd will be out with his sheep at nighttime. He needs to bring them into a safe place. So he would find a sheep pen. He would lead his sheep into that pen. This picture, by the way, is right at the city of Hippos. So we've talked about that Decapolis city that sits on that, where the pagans live. That's the polis, the Greek city, Hippos, and this is right outside of Hippos. But here's what I wanted to show you. I just, as I was putting this together, I thought, oh, that's kind of a cool shot there. So you have the sheepfold. And right here, if you notice, if I bring that circle down, if you notice in that sheepfold is a little opening. Of course, you have to, you have, to have an opening to bring the sheep 
in and out of. That's the gate to the sheepfold. And you have to protect against wolves, against lions. So who protects the sheep against the enemy? Well, the shepherd does. And so one of the things the shepherd does would sleep in the gate. So the shepherd would lay down right at that gate so that if an animal were to try to come through the gate, the shepherd would stop it. Now that sounds like fun, especially if there's lions around to be woken up in the middle of the night. But what does Jesus say? So in John, and we're not going to look at the verse, but John 10, it's verse 7. Jesus says, I am the gate for the sheep. So he calls himself the actual gate for the sheep. And so it's a cool imagery to see that when he would say, I'm the gate for the sheep, I protect the sheep from the enemy, everybody would understand it because sheepfold are everywhere in Israel and you know that the shepherds sleep inside the gate. So I just wanted to show you that little bonus material. Um, okay, let's go. Let's move on. Okay, so we're, we need to talk about this legend. It's uh, how lucky we are to live next to the Sea of Galilee. It's fresh water. It's amazing that God is still blessing us, and this is going to be a legend based on Scripture. So, you know, Scripture, especially the Old Testament, so many details are missing. And, well, I'll, I'll give you this example in a minute, but so many details are missing that they would begin to fill in the blanks. So, uh, same thing, just like our Christmas story, right? There's so many details of what, how did Joseph and Mary travel? Well, we put Mary on a donkey, even though it never says that. You know, there's innkeeper, even though it never says that. So we're kind of filling in the blanks to fill out the story. So that's what they're going to do. They're going to take a, something from Scripture, they're going to fill out the story, and then the Sea of Galilee is going to enter that. So the legend, as we know it today, if you want to Google this, you can Google Miriam's Well. And this is a mysterious thing in the Bible. Uh, that the sages wrestled with, and what they came up with was an idea called Miriam's Well. And I'll show you again how it connects to the Sea of Galilee. So where do we get Miriam's Well? Where does that come from? Well, Miriam is obviously the, maybe not obviously, Miriam is the sister of Moses. So in the Bible, well, let me give you, here's one picture, artist rendering of Moses striking the rock and the water, fresh water coming out. This is how they got water in the desert. Moses strikes the rock and like a well of water, water comes out of it. Now you notice, it's great to look at these pictures, these paintings, because notice the clothing. The clothing is much more what you'd think somebody wearing in the Renaissance period would wear. And Moses looks oddly like how we depict Jesus. So whoever painted this picture is there's a lot of conflating going on to bring that into, uh, into uh, modern, what was modern times to them. Anyways, so we have this, this story about getting water in the desert. God's going to bless them with water. And what we notice, very strange thing, there's only two times, two times in the first five books, as they're in the desert, only twice do they mention water how they get water, or getting water for the people. The first time is Exodus 17. Don't turn there, because we're not going to read it, but Exodus 17 is right when they pass through the Red Sea. They're grumbling about water. God says, strike the rock with your staff, and water comes out. And everybody gets water. That's the first time we, you see water. Then you don't hear anything about water until the very end of the journey. So you get to Numbers 20. And in Numbers 20, this is right as they're about to leave the, the promised land, or I'm sorry, leave the, the wilderness to go into the promised land, you get another story about water. So now you scratch your head and you think, well, wait a minute. Where did they get water for 40 years? Because they were moving around. We know they moved around. So where did the water come from? And this is where it's built out that it's going to connect, and we're going to connect it to Miriam in a minute, but it's built out to a legend that is called Miriam's Well. And it's based on 
God is blessing the Israelites based on the merits of Miriam. That's how they view it. Okay, so let's go. Here's what I want you to do. Turn to Numbers 20, because we want to at least read a little bit of this and see how we're going to connect it to Miriam, and then talk about the blessing of water that's coming out of um, bless, God blessing them with water. And what else does that... It's not just the symbolism of water that you drink, it's something else. It's spiritual. Spiritual drink. Just like the manna from heaven. All right, so Numbers 20. And I'm going to start... Well, I put on the screen verse 3, but I'm actually going to start in verse 2. So skip verse 1 for a second, and I'll come back to that, and we're going to look at verse 2. So we, as I said, the very first time they grumbled about water was Exodus 17, right as they had come out, um, as they had passed the Red Sea, and they're on their way to Mount Sinai. So Numbers 20, verse 2 says this, now, there was no water for the community. Now, what happened? Where did the water go? So they apparently had had water, and now there's no water for the community. And the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into his wilderness? That we and our livestock should die here? Kind of sounds like Jonah from last week. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, grapevines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Now, see, we don't, we don't read our Bible this way, but if we, if we had our Torah, the first five books memorized, you would know, well, that's a strange question because they've had water for 40 years. Where did the water go? And this is the puzzle that the Sages are trying to puzzle a lot of the text. How do we read it? So let's go back. Now, what I want you to do is look at verse 1 in Numbers 20, because this is where they come up with, ah, here's what happened with the water. So Numbers 20, verse 1 says this, In the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin and stayed at Kadesh. So they're on the move. Notice that. There... Miriam died and was buried. Oh, Miriam died. Then what happened? Verse 2, there was no water for the community. Aha, Miriam must be connected to having water for the community because the moment Miriam dies, the water goes away and they begin to grumble. So the the sages, again, are just, they're trying to puzzle out what's happening here. And they say, aha, when Miriam died, the water that they had been receiving disappeared. Now, the question, the question, and this is the really tough part, is how did they get water the whole time? Well, what they came up with was that the rock from Exodus 17 that Moses had struck and gave them water actually moved with them in the wilderness. It followed them along. Everywhere they went, this rock would follow along with them. Or some people call it a well, because it became, and every time they stopped, this rock would sit there, and just like a well, water would pull up. Now, that's crazy. We know, we know that's obviously not literal, but they're trying to explain God's blessings on them. So this rock that moved with them through the wilderness and followed them along, and then Miriam dies and the rock no longer puts out water or disappears. And so Moses has to go through the whole process again. So this is what we call then Miriam's well is how they, they named it. It's a rock or it's a well. Now it's not just, it's not just the physical water that you drink, it's the spiritual water, just like the manna from heaven. So there's something about it that's both spiritually edifying and for the physical body edifying. All right, so Miriam's well. Where do we find this? Just so you know, I'm going to give you the reference, um, a reference. So this is one book that you can find this whole story in. 
You can find it a number of places, but this book summarizes, collects all these legends, and then summarizes them. So this is a book called The Legends of the Jews. It's by Lewis Ginsburg, not the same Ginsburg that we had mentioned a few weeks ago. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Same Ginsburg that we mentioned a few weeks ago, but someone in the class had mentioned a different Ginsburg. So this book called Legends of the Jews goes through step by step all the stories from the Old Testament and then where you have different legends that are built in. And what's intriguing about all of this is you then can see how the New Testament writers are often engaging not just the story that's written in the, in the Old Testament, but they're engaging what the people, the common thinking about that story was in what we would call the legends. What do we think about that story? And so Paul might engage that, or Peter might engage something from there, something that's collectively known, but isn't in our Old Testament. So this is a great book. Lots of New Testament references in this, including when he talks about Miriam's well, he's going to mention Paul's writing, which I'll show you in a minute. Okay, so back to Miriam's well. It's a rock or a well that moved along with them in the desert. Now that just sounds ludicrous. But this is how they explained where they got spiritual or where they got water for 40 years, even while they're moving. So let me show you the quote, first of all, from the rabbinic writings. So the quote, I put it on your sheet because you probably don't have this accessible. Uh, so the rabbinic writing says this, thereafter, the water giving rock, so the water giving rock, that's the rock that moved with them, accompanied the children of Israel, throughout their wanderings in the desert. That's the rabbinic writing. Now, let's compare that to Paul. So I want you to turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians 10, and then we're going to look at verses 3 and 4, because Paul is going to use this same legend to address his audience in Corinth, to tell them something about Jesus. So he's engaging the, the common thinking of, the, of a first century Jewish community. What would they know about the story in the desert? So 1 Corinthians 10, verses 3 and 4. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 10, verse 3. They all, speaking of the, those who were in the, uh, with Moses in the desert, they all ate the same spiritual food, that's the manna that God provided them, and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. What's the spiritual rock? That's Miriam's well. And then Paul says, Aha, now that I'm engaging you in, your, in our own legends, now I'm going to tell you how that relates to Jesus. And then he says, and that rock was Christ. So the spiritual blessing that you received in the form of water, but also the spiritual metaphor that accompanied you the whole way in the desert was Jesus, is what basically Paul is saying, the Christ. So, but I want you to see how Paul engages a legend here. He's engaged in something that everybody knows about that doesn't show up when you read the Exodus story. But if you start to puzzle out, well, where did they get water? As we pay attention to how long the different, the gap between the complaints about water, you could see that they're going to draw some story about it. The question that's obviously going through your mind is, what does this have to do with the Sea of Galilee, right? So, the next question became, when they got to the promised land, what happened to that rock? If this rock followed them for 40 years in the desert, they get to the promised land, where did the rock go? That's the question, right? Well, one of the answers is, it went right here, to the Sea of Galilee. And so there's a couple different rabbinic writings that talk about if you go down to the Sea of Galilee and you look in at a certain spot, you can see Miriam's well. That the well, that rock that followed them through the desert, that provided them with the blessings from God, the spiritual blessings, ended up 
right here in Galilee, and it's still providing spiritual blessings for us today. That's the point. So I did put a quote on your, at the bottom of your sheet, number five, there's a quote, and you can find that quote in Legends of the Jews. It says, upon the entrance to the Holy Land, this well disappeared and was hidden in a certain spot of the Sea of Tiberias. That's the Sea of Galilee. What's the point, though? We've got these blessings from the, the water that's right here. Where did the water come from? How is God still blessing us? Now, they're, they're not asking literal questions. They're asking the spiritual questions. It's spiritual water. And the fact is, God's blessing of spiritual water is still there with them, right? It's right there with us. It's, it's your way of saying God is still blessing us today. And we could say the same thing, you know, as we walk through the different deserts of life, as deserts are always presenting themselves to us, the moments when things seem to go into chaos, when you grow weary on your walk and you're thirsty and you need to be refreshed, that there is a spiritual rock that moves along with you. We call him Jesus, and he will refresh you on your journey. He will provide the spiritual water that you need. So it's metaphor, but it's a really cool way to connect the Sea of Galilee to the Bible, or to the, the Bible as far as the Old Testament, and how God is blessing you. So I hope that, um, I hope that was clear enough. I think it's just cool how they mine out from the Old Testament, these little teeny details that we would never even think about, and then bring it into their world to say, and God's still blessing us today. So, okay, that was part one, Sea of Galilee. Now, uh, you can turn your sheet over if you have it. You go to the back side, and we're going to look at, we're going to totally switch gears, and we're going to go to the Jordan River. Now, again, so many events happen around this Jordan River very important for us to then take a close look at what's going on. Okay, back to this map. Let me just show you real quick. You have Mount Hermon. I'll show you pictures of all of this in a minute. You have Mount Hermon in the north. This is where all the headwaters of the Jordan River start. It heads south for about 30 miles into the Sea of Galilee. You have the Sea of Galilee, and then it, the water comes out of the Sea of Galilee, flows down through that rift valley into the Dead Sea, and then it stops, just ends at the Dead Sea. So that's the path of the Jordan River that we're following. So let me show you a couple photos of this. Again, there, this is the Jordan River just to the north of the Sea of Galilee. Looks a little bit different than in the south, because the south is desert. So I'm going to give you, this is the picture you have on the back of page two. It starts at Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon goes up to 9,000 feet, but at 1,200 feet, this is the highest of the, the springs. And so at 1,200 feet, the river begins to flow downhill, and it goes to the Sea of Galilee, and the Sea of Galilee is 700 feet below sea level. So the Salton Sea is only 200 feet below sea level. So the Sea of Galilee, below sea level, and this happens in about 30 miles. So that's pretty good descent, right? That's 2,000 feet that it's descending. All right, so let's take a look here. Here's Mount Hermon, snow-covered for about eight months out of the year. And all of that water, as it flows through the limestone, will eventually just gush out at certain points. And this is one of those points. Many of you have been to this one, Caesarea Philippi. So this is the location of Caesarea Philippi. And you can see that there's the obvious the river right there, the water that's in front of you. But it's just a rock wall right behind that. And the water just literally comes right out of the stone. The water used to flow out of this cave. So where that circle is, the water came right out of that cave. About, I think it was somewhere around 700 AD, there was an earthquake, a geological shift, and the water stopped coming out of the cave and started coming out of a, uh, under the rock that's, I'll show you in a, in a second. 
one thing to note, we talked about the, um, the, the, the way that they view the cosmos and that anytime you have an opening to the earth, that there would be gods underneath the, the earth. The gods, that would be the entrance way, the gate to Hades, they would say. That's what Jesus uses while they're at Caesarea Philippi. The gate to Hades, the opening to the underworld. So if there's an opening like that cave to the underworld, well, then what you're going to do is move that circle over a little bit, and you can see the shrines built right into the side of that rock. And there's the big shrine, the big shrine that you see there is to the god Pan. And Pan was a fertility god. So you want, you want Pan to come out of the cave and water the earth. And then right alongside all of those where Pan's grotto is, then you have all these little niches that are for the nymphs. It's interesting that you find where, wherever you find an opening and water coming out, there you have the worship of a god, and that's exactly what we find. Today, the water comes out somewhere right about where those people are walking. You actually walk along the path and see the water just coming right out of the, the stone beneath you. It's a little bit strange because you can't quite figure out where it's coming from, but it makes that river. So this is Caesarea Philippi. That's one of the headwaters. Another of the headwater is about four miles away at a city called Dan. Ein Dan. Ein means spring, the spring of Dan. And the sign there, it says it's the largest karst spring. Now, karst is where the limestone's been eroded away. In the Middle East, the flow rate of 240 million cubic meters per year. Now, if you took a picture of that sign and then you just turned your body 180 degrees, you would see this, and that's the outflow. So with that, they're talking about that spring outflow just looks like a puddle, but that puddle turns into a heck of a river, and there's water just gurgling out of that. Again, that, all that water is seep coming down from uh, Mount Hermon and creates these springs. All right, so back to our side view. So from the Sea of Galilee, then the water keeps going, and it keeps going downhill. Eventually, it reaches the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is at 1,400 feet below sea level. And that takes about 90 miles. So it's not as steep a descent, um, much more shallow descent. But anyways, that's, our, that's the Jordan River. Starts at Mount Hermon, stops at the Dead Sea. That's it, as far as it goes. What does it mean? What does Jordan mean? Where do we get that name from? Well, there's a debate because we're not really sure exactly where it comes from, but the most popular answer, uh, and I'll give you, I'm going to put the Hebrew up there just for the video later. If anybody wants to go study that, they can, but it's pretty easy. There's a Hebrew word, Yarad. So if you say Yarad, Yod Resh Dalit, Yarad. Yarad means to descend. Hebrew is based on verbs. Hebrew is all about action. If you find a name, look at what the verb root is, because it tells you what the action is. So what's Jesus's Jewish root to his name, Yeshua? Well, Yesha is, to, is salvation. So his verb for his own name is salvation. And what is Jesus? He is the salvation. He's God's salvation. So, yarad, the verb, to descend. If we take the Hebrew then, and we add a, what our, in our alphabet would be an N, a nun, you get the word yarden. So, from the root word to descend, you get Jordan. Now, it obviously comes into English much different, but the yarden. So, the, the name, this is what many people think, is that the name of the river is the descender, because it comes from the root verb to descend. Now, why? Why descender? Is it because there's a pretty good descent from Mount Hermon down to the Dead Sea? That's one possibility. We don't know. Another one, another possible answer to that is that to get to the river is very difficult. There's very steep descents to get from the, the surrounding plateaus around the river down to the actual water. 
So every time you want to get to the river, you have to descend to get to the river. So is that possibly why they call it a descender? We don't know. But those are the two, those are the two most popular interpretations. So the Yarden, the descender, the river that descends. So the Jordan River, the, the most common depiction of the river in the Bible is as a boundary. So you notice it's the, it's the eastern boundary to the land of Israel, at least from the Dead Sea north. So it's a dividing line. You have to cross the Jordan to get somewhere. But what's a little strange about this is the, the Jordan River is not a big river, and it's so short, right? It's such a short river. So one thing we can study about the Jordan River is when the Israelites show up to the Promised Land, God leads them in a very particular direction that forces them to cross the Jordan. So if I put up the map again, you'll all remember the story as Joshua is leading the Israelites into the promised land. The first place they go to is across from Jericho. And we notice that God brings them up the eastern side of the Dead Sea, but then they have to cross a river. And the river, by the way, as I'll show you in a minute, is at flood stage because it's springtime. It's time for the Passover, just like next week is the Passover. It becomes now a strange thing. Well, wait a minute, God. If you wanted to bring your people into the promised land, why not just go up this side of the river? Why not go past Beersheba and Hebron? I mean, Hebron is where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are buried. Why not go that direction? Why bring them around the Dead Sea so that you must cross a river? And not only a river, but a river that's at flood stage. This is Joshua 3.15. Now the George, the George, now the Jordan is at flood stage during harvest. So there's something bigger going on. There's an object lesson. There's more to the story than just the narrative they had to cross a river. God led them to the point where they have to cross a river at flood stage to teach them a lesson. And this is what we're going to do next week, because it's such a cool lesson. To realize there's much more to the story. You could have just as easily not crossed the river. Or it's if, it, if it's at flood stage, just wait six months and the river would be down. It's much easier to go across. Why does God force them to go across at flood stage? Not only does the Jordan River have geographical boundaries, but it's a spiritual metaphor. What do we call What's, think of all the songs that are written about crossing the Jordan River. There's one more river to cross. The, the metaphor that we use to go to heaven is to cross the Jordan River. I remember a funeral I was at, and I'll tell you more about it later. A funeral where the, the person giving the eulogy was saying, I see a man across the river. And he's going to heal you. And it was just this really cool uh, message. Because that's the, that's the spiritual metaphor. You have to go through some sort of boundary in order to transition to something bigger. So when they come into the promised land, you take them through a watery boundary that causes them to transition into a new being, a new creation. They've made it to the promised land. They're no longer, it's like a graduation ceremony. So it's a spiritual metaphor. And it's probably more in our minds the spiritual metaphor. It's Jesus who goes down to the Jordan to be baptized. It's the crossing of the, the Jordan. It's, um, anyways, the spiritual metaphor is very important of the Jordan River. It's a barrier, and we'll do this next week because it's such a cool way to think about the points in our life when we transition into something new, a new creation. Okay. Final piece, and this is going to seem, well, I'll try to connect at least what we're saying today, and it, even if it seems a little bit strange. The sages of Israel love to take the concrete, the things that you can see, touch, smell, and bring them into some kind of life lesson. And so they do that with the Sea of Galilee. Now, I heard this when I was first in Israel uh, with Ray Vanderland. I've read it a number of different places since then, but we call it the lesson of the two seas. How do we take the two seas of Israel, put them together, 
and bring a lesson to how we live in this world today. So it would look something like this. I'm just going to, I'm going to try to speak it out as a rabbi might speak a parable. So follow along with me. There are two types of seas in the land of Israel. One is alive. The other one is dead. The alive one is fresh. Fresh water. There are fish and plants and animals and people, and all of them thrive. The sea sustains life all around them in this dry and thirsty land. The second sea is full of salt, and it's dead. There's no fish. There's no animals. It's hot. It's inhospitable. And the people struggle to live there. And you might think now, what's the difference between these two seas? Well, it's not the Jordan River. The Jordan River flows into both of them. The difference is this. The Sea of Galilee, the Alive Sea, the Freshwater Sea, it not only receives the water of the Jordan River, but it freely gives back to the land as the water enters from the north and exits to the south. The Dead Sea, on the other hand, only receives. It only receives the water of the Jordan. It's selfish and it doesn't give anything away. There are two seas in the land of Israel. One is alive and one is dead. There are two types of people in the world. One is alive and one is dead. That is at least an introduction to the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee. 